the spectacular stage thing which you had on the first tour in Australia. When did that yeah. start to evolve on stage? I think we had ideas from the very, very early stages. I think it just developed as, yeah. as we got to do more gigs and as we gained experience and things like that. I think there were a lot of ideas that we wanted to try out both on record and on stage. Mm. But there's something that you can't do all at once. I mean, you've just got to be in the right sort of stage in your career to do larger right. things. Like, you, you couldn't start off with a, a huge entourage of lights because, no. I mean, we weren't doing uh, bigger venues. So you had to sort of, like, wait for your turn. Right. But it came pretty quickly, I think. Now, with Queen 1, Queen 2, mm. Killer Queen, uh, you were building up an immense uh, uh, album following um, with, with, with those albums. Then, uh, and also, I mean, you were also breaking into the singles market uh, in quite mm. a big way. Mm. But with, with Bohemian Rhapsody and A Night at the Opera, uh, I mean, that, that was the absolute breakout. Yeah, well, that, that really um, tore the market up. Tore, tore the market up and down, didn't it? I mean, it sort of, um, it just kind of got us a totally different, um, uh, it got us to a very different area. I mean, the, the cro cross section of sort of um, uh, the public then w was so different. I mean, we were then suddenly, we suddenly realized we were playing to mums and dads, and, and I mean, like the people that were coming to see us were totally different. And um, I think it was a very good thing, because, I mean, we just sort of, it was just gathering a much larger sort of audience, really. Yeah. And um, it helped enormously. Now, for an act that had been um, so visual on stage, mm. uh, and I'm still referring to the Bohemian Rhapsody time, suddenly, uh, in that year, came one of the classiest film clips. Open your eyes, look up to the skies and in terms of thinking of Bohemian Rhapsody as a, as a record concept, I think we thought of it in terms of visuals as well. I, I could really picture that, that, that sort of song in sort of visuals. So I think when, when it came to doing the promotional film, I think it was quite easy because um, uh, people think we spent uh, hours and hours making that film. In, in, in fact, it took literally about four, four hours, I think. The way we choose singles are sort of their album tracks, basically. I don't think we actually write a single and say this is going to be, be the single. And what we, I think, try and do is try and, with, with each album, try and work out what is, uh, what, where our music at, is at, at, at the current given time, yeah. and, and, and try and showcase it in, in, say, one single, in one sort of number. And that's what... Um, uh, takes the, the sort of single format. With the Night of the Opera, we just felt that Bohemian Rhapsody was mm. uh, the song that would, would sort of uh, say what we're doing at the, at the given time. So we sort of chose that. Now, obviously, we came across uh, certain barriers, like it being uh, six minutes long mm. or whatever, and we said, we, I mean, there were numerous rows. I mean, well, the recording the company wanted to in actual fact edit it. Right? Edit it and things like that, yes. And we just thought, there's no point. You either sort of hear it in its entirety or pick another another song. Yeah. And I think we were so sort of confident with that sort of number. I mean, it is a risk, I know. And we either thought it was either going to be an enormous flop or a huge success, right. you know, depending on... Well, I mean, time. both both the single and the album became, I mean, like chart monsters. And I, I noticed that, in fact, Bohemian Rhapsody won an award the other day for one of the best the compositions. BPI thing. Yeah, for over the past 25 years. Mm. The pressure then on the group must have been immense to do the follow-up album, which was a day at the races. True, I think um, people will obviously, no matter how um, hard you try, will think of in terms of your past hits. That's inevitable. But I think it's up to the group and the musicians to really uh, think in other terms. From my point of view, I mean, as far as the writing side of it was concerned, I really thought I, I said, okay, Bohemian Rhapsody, big hit. But as far as my writing abilities were concerned, I think I could write better anyway. Mm. And I just looked at it. And, uh, from that point of view, I mean, I just went and wrote, uh, from my estimation, I think a song like Somebody to Love mm. is, in my estimation, a better sort of, uh, uh, from the writing aspect, a better song, you mm. see. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult, because obviously people think of sort of uh, songs in terms of hits, obviously. Right. And then they will obviously say, well, Somebody to Love was not as good a song because it wasn't as big a hit. But it really depends on how you look at it. Mm. I didn't quite know whether We Are the Champions was a sort of a, uh, a sort of a subtle thing of saying, well, you may think, you know, 
the I, mean, I, I think we always write songs like that. It's, it really is up to the listener to, to make up its interpretation. I think it's nice. I think up to, up to now, I think e even now, um, it, it's got to a stage where um, we do it subconsciously, you know, I mean, and we write, especially my songs, I mean, they don't state very categorically. I mean, they're very sort of, they can, they can go into different sort of areas. And I like that, actually. I mean, it's, it's a n nice escape f for me from the writer's point of view, but I think from the listener's point of view, it's nice that they can make up different interpretations. So basically, from, if you ask me what it's all about, I would say it, it's, it is tongue-in-cheek, and you're not, not to be, it's not to be taken too seriously. I mean, I, my God, I can't be serious. No. You know, it's, but, uh, it's, it's, just it's just something that I wanted to write a song that was very cold and calculated, and kind of to the point. And uh, basically, it was a song of sort of participation. I wanted people to sort of participate. I was looking at it from the sort of um, the show point of view as well, how we were going to sort of do that. And I just thought, why... I wasn't going to sort of beat around the bush. I thought I'm going to be as blatant as well, possible. Well, can I just interrupt there? Yeah. Uh, I remember also you saying last year that it was sort of like being... You might as well be in a jail, uh, the time you were spending in the studios. Mm. Uh, and I notice here you've said, I've done my sentence but committed no crime and bad mistakes. <laughs> oh, that's, all few. that's all very theatrical. Right. And then it get, keeps going and then it says, which... This probably makes a lot of people think, I've taken my bows and my curtain calls. You brought me fame and fortune and everything that goes with that. I thank you all. But it's been no bed of roses. Yeah. It's, it's uh, my way of saying that um, uh, to a lot of people, I mean, that's, that's like a lot of people think uh, being a, a rock and roll star is, is kind of going to a studio, making a disc, and then, then going around uh, um, spending all the money, which I don't think it is. And I think... I know that a lot of people do realise that, but even at the same time, a lot of people don't. They think it's it's a very easygoing life, and I mean, like, a lot of people still think, when I say, oh, we're going to America for a tour, they think, oh, nice long holiday. And that's just my way of saying that it's not easygoing. I mean, God, I mean, don't for one minute think that uh, it's all peaches and cream. Now, may I ask you a couple of pertinent questions? Oh, what are they? Um, for the first one being, uh, being uh, like one of the world's top groups, and oh, nice. living in a country, well, I mean, it's yeah. true. Uh, you can ask me about taxes, go on. No, I'm oh, not. Thank God. L living in London, um, with the punk rock craze coming along. Mm. Um, What's that? Does it become a challenge, you know, in, in the sense where it's you're finding these amazing contrasts and like, like you'll find the punk rock writers who will follow a certain stream and may try to put down the established top world acts of today. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a challenge to you and the rest it's, of the guys? It's always been a challenge. I'd, uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter what, even if there is a new movement or call it what you want, there's always a challenge. I mean, uh, I mean, look at, take for example, the charts today. Mm. I mean, at the moment, I, th I feel this enormous competition with just the established acts. Mm. I mean, there's ELO, there's ABBA, there's Rod Stewart. So, I mean, you know, it's, there's always competition and we're never going to sort of... Uh, I'm never one f for resting on my laurels, really, because mm. I always know there's that competition and that's what keeps us, you know, keeps the driving force there. Well, but with the new stuff, I know, I think it's, it's all healthy. Mm. I think there's always going to be a, a kind of a new movement because, I mean, that's how we start. Can I, can I be bold to say that then I think it almost brings the cunning out in you? I think the, you almost enjoy it. Oh, yes. I mean, the day where we sort of say um, that, well, we're the greatest or whatever. I mean, there you are. We're the champions. I mean, it's not mm. meant to be taken. Uh, but but one could almost look at it that way as well. Yeah. I mean, the, we, we certainly haven't hit, hit our peaks. Mm. I mean, there's always, you've got to keep going. I think there's so much we still have to do.